with a different sermon title, We Should Have Seen All of This Coming. Let us step into a time of prayer. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. We should have seen this coming. There were signs all the way along that pointed to what happened. From his earliest years, we knew this man was different. Just ask his family. But we never knew it would come down to this. We should have seen this coming, but we didn't. And neither did his cousin. Cousin John is down in the Jordan River when Jesus shows up and gets in line for his baptism. Jesus wasn't famous. No one knew anything about him. He hadn't committed any miracles yet. He hadn't saved humanity yet. He simply stood in line waiting his turn, just like people are standing in line waiting their turns for their COVID-19 vaccines or standing in line in recent months to vote. Excited, but a little bit nervous and frightened. John recognizes him as he enters the water, and to the rest of the newly baptized, the newly redeemed, and those waiting unredeemed sinners by the river, it just looks like two guys talking. But attention is drawn to Jesus as he emerges from the water, and the heavens tear open, and the Spirit descends on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven says, you are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At this point, there's no doubt about it. Jesus is different. This didn't happen when any of the rest of them were baptized. When everyone else is being baptized, there are no clouds tearing, there are no heavens ripping open, there is no divine voice booming, there's no spirit descending. The language of slashing and slicing and shredding and clawing sounds more like the unleashing of a caged tiger than the baptisms of which I've been a part. How about you, Reverend Corzine? Have you found tigers at the font? I don't think so. Listen to Mark's words. His word for torn apart is schizo. We hear that word in our own use today, but what it means is to cleave asunder, to rend. It's a strangely violent word to describe a happy occasion. This is not peaceful and gentle. Heaven is torn apart. It's the same word that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all use to describe the moment on Good Friday when Jesus has died on the cross and the curtain of the temple is schizo, it's torn in two. In a word, this word resonates from the prophets of old. Isaiah particularly speaks to God and says, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Mark wants us all to know that Jesus is the one for whom God tears apart the heavens to come down. This is a radical act in Mark. God commits the act of breaking and entering the world to deliver Jesus to us, and we should have seen it coming. You see, God has the power and the willpower and the fierce determination of a tiger to tear open the heavens and deliver goodness and grace and peace and justice and love into the world. Although we don't associate this power with the fierceness of baptism, we should. Through each of our baptisms, God is powerfully at work. At our baptism, 
or as our parents speak for our children at baptism, we answer a clear and unequivocal question. Do you renounce the power of evil and accept the freedom of new life in Christ? This is not a timid question. This is the most ancient question of Christian faith. This goes back to the first days and weeks and months of our faith. It is a question which turns us around. We must renounce evil before we can embrace the freedom in Christ. We cannot be baptized without renouncing evil. And once we've renounced evil, there is no going back. I have been thinking a lot about heaven tearing open and renouncing evil this week. I've been thinking a lot about my baptismal vows. I've been thinking a lot about your baptismal vows, about all of our baptismal vows. Every single one of us who call ourselves Christians, or because that word has become so repulsive to so many people, maybe a follower of Jesus. Let's go with that. I never speak lightly of evil. I do not use the word unless I mean it, because to do so is a very dangerous thing. When I speak out against evil, I do so from the depths of my baptismal vows, my dedication to Jesus Christ, and my promise to you and to all whom I love and serve. So please listen carefully. On this day in which we renew our baptismal vows, I call you to remember that each and every one of us is made a Christian through our baptismal vows. We start the vows to become a Christian by renouncing evil. Make no mistake about it, evil is powerful. In his book, The People of the Lie, Christian and psychologist M. Scott Peck correctly describes evil as the creating of chaos. He says, Evil is the state of chaos created by people in this world. Ones who are evil and create and sustain an environment of chaos are good at it and determined to create it and determined to sustain it. They are good at planting seeds of doubt about those who are good and loving and grace-filled. They usually present themselves as good, sometimes better than others. But make no mistake about it, while they rationalize their actions, their intentions are to tear down and destroy anyone that they feel needs to be destroyed. Wow. The idea that human evil exists is difficult for many of us to swallow. Most like to consider evil an archaic concept that just doesn't apply to our modern scientific minds and society, it just doesn't work. We want to reduce evil to a medical diagnosis, perhaps some personality disorder or something that could be managed with a pill. But friends, there is no pill that cures evil. Scott Peck goes on to describe <coughs> evil people as being very aware of their conscience, <clears throat> but actively choosing to ignore it, as opposed to a psychopathic, sociopathic person who appears to be devoid of conscience altogether. In other words, an evil person knows that they are doing evil, while a sociopath does not, even though their actions look very similar. Peck describes evil as militant ignorance. Evil people are obsessed with maintaining their self-image of perfection through self-deception. 
In addition, evil people will be very selective about who they inflict their evil upon while going to great lengths to maintain an image of respectability and normality with everyone else. As a result, evil people are often well-liked by the majority, and their victims come across as being overly sensitive, highly persecution complex oriented, or even crazy. Those are the words they use for the people they target. Peck says, evil people unable to face the painful reality of their character will often place themselves in positions of power or moral superiority. And they use their position of power to destroy anyone who questions them in any way. Wow! Now can you see why I believe that we were witnessing the unleashing of evil on Epiphany on Wednesday, January 6th? A busload of right-wing paramilitary proud boys came six blocks west of First Church to the State House grounds. A busload got off and attacked peaceful protesters on the State House grounds. They beat them, they hit them, they kicked them. None of them were arrested, and they got back on the bus and went. At the same time, the capital of the United States was under assault. That, my friends, is coordinated, and it's evil. It wasn't just angry people getting out of hand. It was militant ignorance. It was evil unleashed on Epiphany. As I look at the unleashing of evil on January 6th on Epiphany and all the intense days that have followed, I could go any number of directions with my reflections today. I could talk about the murder of Officer Brian Sicknick. And as I was told by Victor John, who knows his goodness, he said he was a good man. He was an active Episcopalian. He was a rescuer of aging dachshunds. And his skull was crushed by a mob who used a fire extinguisher to beat his brains out. I could talk about Ashley Babbitt, who was shot and killed as she was breaking into the house chambers and is now being canonized as a saint by her brothers and sisters of hate on the front lines of white nationalism. I could talk about the desecration and shooting and looting of the state of the House and the Senate chambers, the rotunda and the statuary hall, and all of the Capitol officers of, offices of our elected leaders. I could talk about the mob, which was almost completely white, being seemingly welcomed by Capitol Police at times, and certainly acting as though they were overwhelmed, and they were, when they were completely unprepared for an all-out assault on the building of the people, the citadel of democracy. Or I could talk about structural racism, in which 54 arrests occurred with over 1,000 mobsters in the place. Meanwhile, back in May, 289 arrests of peaceful demonstrators happened when George Floyd was murdered and they were miles from the Capitol. I could talk about the white mob who terrorized the entire elected leadership of the United States government, who were all there in and around the Capitol with the exception of Donald Trump, who sent the mob off to the Capitol and then safely returned to the White House to watch the story unfold on the news a mob that he had unleashed on democracy. Or perhaps I could talk about the fact that this was the first time ever that Americans assaulted our citadel of democracy. The only other attack coming in the history of our nation was, on, was during the War of 1812 when the British, our enemy, attacked and burned the capital to the ground in 1814. Not since then or before then had it ever happened. I could talk about how some of these domestic terrorists just walked out into the night. Not some, hundreds, like nothing had happened, with seemingly no consequences. 
and minimal arrests and no law enforcement or National Guard or anyone to stop them. I could even talk about how the president, after instigating the entire attack on our democracy, never called in the National Guard, though he lied and said he did, never claimed any responsibility, and sort of mentioned to the rioters it might be okay to leave while calling them great patriots and telling them, I love you. I could talk about all these things because outside of Officer Sicknitz's heroism and sacrifice, every one of the things I have mentioned speaks to the unleashing of evil. But I only want to talk about one thing. I want to lift up one thing before I sit down. It's one thing that we all need to consider today as we, as Christians, engage our own life of faith. How baptized Christians were fully engaged in this insurrection and how we must choose to reject evil and face down what they did and embrace our freedom of new life in Christ. On Wednesday, white Christian nationalists led the riots and insurrection. Let me say that again. On Wednesday, white Christian nationalists led the riots and insurrection. On Thursday, the Reverend Dr. Robert Jones wrote this powerful analysis. If there was one thing of value to come out of the shameful chaos of Wednesday's attack on the U.S. Capitol, it's that the horrific events made plain the powerful ideological and theological current of American politics that often stay just under the surface. The emblems carried by the rioters, particularly the comfortable juxtaposition of Christian and white supremacist symbols, bear witness to these forces. There were many crosses, Jesus saves signs, Jesus 2020 flags that mimic the design or use the same design as the Trump flags. Some of the participants organized a part of the march called the Jericho March. They blew the shofars, the Jewish ritual horns, as they circled the capital, reenacting the siege of Jericho by the Israelites described in the book of Joshua in the Hebrew Bible. That's insane! And one video showed the Christian flag, white with the blue canton containing a red cross, being paraded into the empty congressional chamber after the doors had been breached and the members of Congress had been evacuated. The Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg wrote that the conflation of Trump and Jesus was a common theme at the rally that day among people he interviewed. It's all in the Bible, they said. Everything's predicted, they said. Donald Trump is in the Bible, they said. Get yourself ready, one told him. Give it up if you believe in Jesus. And to the cheers of the mob around him, the man continued, give it up if you believe in Donald Trump, which brought roarous laughter and joy and cheering. Comfortably intermingled with Christian rhetoric, and these Christian icons were explicit symbols of white supremacy. Outside the Capitol, Trump supporters erected a large wooden gallows with a bright orange noose ominously dangling at the center to show all of us that they will lynch anybody that is against them. These Trump supporters managed to do something, and it makes me cry. I'm going to lose it. They managed to do something that the Confederate Army was never able to accomplish, to fly the Confederate battle flag inside the United States Capitol. Shame on them. Shame, eternal shame. At least one protester sported a Camp Auschwitz hoodie. On the back it read, Staff as a reference to the concentration camp where over one million Jews were killed by the Nazis. And many others wore t-shirts which just said 6MWE, meaning six million wasn't enough, while making outlandish comparisons between Christians as victims of American society and European Jews in the Third Reich. 
You heard that right. We must take these symbols and this rhetoric seriously, not in isolation, but in combination and conversation with each other. This seditious mob was motivated not only by loyalty to Trump, but by an unholy amalgamation of white supremacy and Christianity that has plagued our nation since its inception and is still with us today. There remains a disturbingly strong link between holding racist and anti-Semitic attitudes and identifying as a white Christian. We should remember that at this moment and the divisions of the past four years, everything is set against the upheaval of religious and demographic change. By that I mean since 1968, excuse me, since 2008, the country has moved from being a majority Christian nation to one that is no longer a majority Christian nation, from 54% white and Christian to 44% white and Christian. This change took place during the tenure of our first African-American president. And the dysfunction and violence that we are seeing is in large part an attempt to preserve a vision of white Christian America that is passing away. The willingness among those in the crowd on Epiphany on January 6th to believe outlandish conspiracy theories and the unwillingness to accept the election results are born from the same source, a desperate desire by some white Christians to hang on to ownership of a diversifying nation. As many have rightly declared, the violent disregard for the rule of law witnessed that day is not the best of who we are, clearly. But if we're going to heal our nation, we need to confess that it remains still today a troubling part of America's political and religious heritage and landscape. We should have seen all of this coming. The heavens being torn apart, more like the unleashing of a caged tiger than a gentle dove descending. We should have seen the riots which scarred our nation and Epiphany 2021. Perhaps our ancient ancestors in Christian faith knew more than we do when they called each new Christian to baptism and the first thing they called them to do was renounce the powers of evil and accept the freedom of new life in Christ. They knew what Jesus and John knew. They knew that baptism and our journey to faith and into faith takes all of our resolve, all of our commitment to justice and peace, all of our determination to embrace the truth of God's gospel of love. They knew that to be a Christian really means to take everything we have and to walk in the light and the love of Christ. So before this morning ends, before this service ends, I want you to put your hands in the water in your home, the water of baptism, one more time. I want you to make the sign of the cross. I want you to make the sign of the cross on your forehead three times. And I want you to ask for God's help to face all the days ahead because we have seen it coming and because we will need all of the strength for every step of the way to step into the future as God's holy ones, chosen and beloved, who have put on baptism this day in Christ. Amen.